Hey everybody, and welcome to Why Buy. In this episode, I'm gonna be talking about how you can prep your sports car for some fun winter driving, things you should know and things you should avoid, plus how my car went from being like this to being like this. For starters, why even contemplate driving your precious sports car in the winter? Well. For one, <laughs> driving a V8 with 450 horsepower is pretty fun. When you drive this car, you'll notice that if you want to be on the power, like the revs have to be up if you want that kind of throw you back in your seat kind of thing. You know, like right now I'm at 4,000 and it's, oh yeah, it, it goes. Um, but that's a big difference if I'm, say, at like 6,000 RPM. Oh, fuck! <laughs> it, uh, it's more of a snap. <laughs> you know, I will say I enjoy driving this car in the winter, but the truth is, this is like somewhere in between. There's no snow on the ground, and this is just crap. And it's impossible to keep your car clean with this stuff. And you can't put on summer tires because that's like a death wish. Be careful what you wish for. Literally within, I want to say two hours, <laughs> it's just turned into an absolute blizzard. But if I'm completely honest, I really do hate the wear and tear that happens to your vehicle during the winter. Whether it's the stuff they spray on the roads, whether it's the rock chips and gravel that you find, it really is kind of amplifying the damage that happens to your car. I'm literally washing it two to three times a week and it's just, I mean, it's a losing battle. I just washed the car before I got here. One minute you're driving, you're starting to appreciate that the road's clearing up and the scenery's getting lovely, and then bam, you get a rock chip right in the windshield or in the front of the car. And I still cringe when I hear that sound knowing if whether or not it caused a paint chip. Damn it! Not to mention the danger that comes with driving your car in the winter with other drivers who may not be as prepared as you. This video is not just gonna cover some tips and tricks, but it's also some of the harsh lessons I've learned over the years driving in the winter. So what are some things that you can do to get ready for winter driving your sports car? Let's start with tires, winter tires to be specific, because I know you're thinking, well, I'll just buy all seasons and run them year round, no big deal. The truth is, is that even with a good drivetrain, like an all-wheel drive or permanent all-wheel drive system, while you may be able to get going or climb a hill easy, when it comes to stopping and cornering, the only contact patch you have with the ground is the rubber. By the way, if you are wondering about the best performance tires for the summer, there is an episode that you should check out, the RS5 part two. But back to the point, winter tires versus all season tires. What's the difference? Before I get into the technology of winter tires, just think of wearing a bowling shoe to a marathon. Yes, it covers your feet, but it doesn't quite cut it when it comes to performance.
Okay, so not to be like a wimp here, but it's actually really cold right now. And like, I don't even know if you can see my hands are red, my face. Cody, how you doing? It's chilly. Yeah, pretty fantastic. So I'm gonna do the rest of the dialogue inside. We'll continue the winter driving your sports car uh, after these messages. It's not the prettiest world, prettiest world, prettiest world you'll see. It's not the prettiest world or the most fun, but it's pretty enough for me. Well, you may think I look sad like a rest. Uh, look at the tread difference in terms of uh, just an exaggerated comparison between a summer tire and the winter tire. You can see that the tread design is not only different, but there's a lot more going on when you pay close attention. Um, summer tires tend to be a lot more flush in their design. They wanna have a high contact patch and there isn't much uh, in the way of concern for a lot of loose debris on the road. So it can be practically with barely any tread design at all. What's really the, the magic with summer tires is the rubber compound. But juxtaposed, say, to a winter tire, which is way more extreme in terms of tread design, you have much deeper channels and you also have these tiny little slats uh, at the top of, you know, where the meat of the tire is. So why is that there? When you look at winter conditions like rain, slush, that kind of soupy stuff that tends to draw your vehicle off the road if you go into it, winter tires are designed with these channels that are meant to whisk away uh, that slush so that it's actually cutting through it rather than it pulling you around and, and moving the vehicle around. And when you also consider that the rubber compound is very soft, uh, if you do hit ice or if you it, the temperatures are really cold, that rubber is not going to get so stiff that it can't actually hook up to the ground. So um, it's kind of a, a, an advantage to have the soft compound, albeit if you were to drive it in the summer, of course, it would kind of melt away prematurely because the rubber is so much softer. One of the things that I would recommend, uh, especially if you're uh, putting these winter tires onto a bigger wheel diameter, like a 19 or a 20 inch, um, still see if you can get a taller sidewall height to add a little bit of ground clearance and a little bit more of a plush ride, uh, especially for the winter with the ice and the bumps on the road. Your wheel well might not be able to fit a taller sidewall, but mine could with the stock suspension ride height. So in essence, um, I think the stock tire is a 275, 30, 20, and for the winter tires, I went 255, uh, 35, uh, 20. So same wheel diameter, 20 inches, but a bit uh, taller sidewall uh, simply because, you know, I wanted a little bit of extra ground clearance and a little bit of extra, you know, between me and the road. So anyways, another thing you want to consider is the fact that if you are buying a second set of wheels, um, just keep in mind, they're going to get a little bit more wear and tear in the winter time. And um, the pattern design is actually pretty important for snow getting inside the, the wheel well or the barrel of the wheel. And uh, what you don't want happening is ice and snow building up on the inside, throwing off the balance of the car. Um, it's not such a big deal if you have an open spoke design, but if you can try and find something that, you know, at the very least isn't extremely complicated, like uh, the super speed wheels I have, because to clean them, <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it's quite a bit of work, so uh, they look really good, but uh, it does take a lot more time to clean. And again, just going back to the cost factor, if you are pondering, you know, winter tires versus all season tires, uh, in terms of longevity and wear and tear, when you think about having two sets of wheels and two sets of tires, you're only putting wear and tear on those tires during the seasons that they're on the car versus all seasons. If you're running them year round, you're wearing them constantly. Now, uh, in short, if you think about the longevity of it, all season tires, yeah, you might get three to four years out of a set of tires, maybe even five years, maybe, depending on how you drive. Um, but on the flip side, if you're running winter tires and summer tires on two different sets of wheels, or even on the same set of wheels, 
um, you're going to get the same amount of time out of them and uh, maybe even more. But that's not the, the real benefit. The benefit is you're getting optimal traction for the conditions you're driving in, whether it's ice, slush, uh, you know, summertime, high heat, rain, whatever. You're buying a better rubber compound for the season it was engineered for. It's kind of like having the best traction for all situations rather than having sort of mediocre traction in, in all situations. So it's something to consider. years ago rubber technology in tires hadn't really gotten that very far so the best option for ice and just hard compact nothing really to grip onto was studded tires you know you have these steel studs in the tire and you can always hear vehicles when they're driving around with it's like anyways when you hit just sheer ice and there's no traction at all those studs are designed to dig into the ice now if you look at tire technology today, especially there's no key in um, Hakapalita R's that are on the RS5, um, you can see the channel slots uh, in the tire tread and they're very, very small, but what they're intended to do is when the tire heats up, um, and they do get really hot, right? Because you're the friction on, on, on the ground, even though it's cold outside. But when it comes into contact with the ground, those little slots almost act like suction cups, right? Because it comes into contact with the ice. Uh, it looses, um, how should I say this? It, it, it sort of melts <laughs> the top layer of the ice and those act as like, you know, these little suction cups that give you a little bit more traction on the ice. And I was like, well, is it better than studded tires? And they're actually, pretty much the same. It's quite comparable. Um, even Nokian, if you uh, go on their website and look at the comparison videos, you'll see the Hakapalita R's perform as good, if not you know, the exact same as the studded tires that they have. So it uh, just goes to show that the technology has come a long way. This is probably a bad time to be going out for groceries. If it's snowing really heavily outside, um, one of the things that you'll notice, especially with winter tires, uh, they almost get compact full of snow. Like it's almost like you can't even see the tread um, when you park the car. It just looks like this kind of marshmallow <laughs> that it turns into, but that's, that's actually deliberate um, because snow likes to stick to snow. Um, so when it compacts in the tire tread, it's actually more effective of gripping uh, at the ground. So this is the benefit of having, you know, a good winter tire in these conditions because nature is unpredictable and you don't really know when you're going to get hit with a blizzard or freezing rain. And to have a tire compound that is engineered for these conditions uh, just lets you have a little bit more peace of mind, right? You can enjoy uh, driving a little bit more uh, quickly or spirited or not have to do, you know, half the speed limit because you're terrified you're, you're gonna fly off the road. I also realize that you know <laughs> at this topic uh, this part of the episode might be a little bit boring because it's tires and who cares about you know tire technology and how this stuff works so if there's one thing that you take away from this part of the video is when it comes to what people choose to buy, whether it's used tires or cheap tires or whatever, it's it's not always you that might be taking that risk, right? But when other people on the road don't invest uh, into buying good tire technology, at the very least, you're not endangering yourself or the people around you because you have more control. And, and that's for the small premium. I talked about this in the other video, but it's it's really about giving you the driver more control of the vehicle and uh, it might be to react to different conditions it might be to react to other drivers uh, but at the end of the day you're valuing your life and you're valuing your car
let's switch gears here and talk about um, another important topic, I think, when it comes to winter driving a sports car. Um, I think trying to keep your car clean in this stuff is probably the biggest pain in the ass. <laughs> because anywhere you go, if it's wet, there's this stuff they put on the roads, right? That just loves to stick to your car. And, you know, I've had an endless battle trying to keep my car clean when they spray, whatever it is they spray on the roads, because when it bonds to the clear coat, it just adheres and crusts and then more builds on top of that. And you see people with their wheel wells just full of this stuff because they never wash it or, or knock it off, right? And problem is, is that it becomes a genuine hazard um, in the winter time. You get these ice chunks that fly off these cars on the road and they're like rocks, you know, uh, can really cause some serious damage or an accident. And, you know, safety aside, um, if you know me uh, or you've watched the Why Buy show, you know that I take car detailing pretty seriously. Um, and uh, it's something that in the winter time, I'm always very careful because I don't want to scratch the clear coat or cause marring uh, or any damage unnecessarily. But it's really tough to do, especially in like minus 20, minus 30 degree uh, weather. So what can you do to help keep your car clean? And I'm not just talking about, you know, going through a car wash. I'm, I'm talking about preventative measures that can make it easier to clean and actually cause less damage when you go to those uh, car washes. The best thing you can do if you can't do a, a bucket like hand wash traditionally is just to go to a hot pressurized uh, car wash place. And I realize, you know, <laughs> I'm going back on what I said again. Um, because pressure washers can cause damage, right? Um, that high pressure, when you're blasting it at your car, what ends up happening is, don't think of it as washing away that grime and that stuff that's stuck on your car. Think of it as pushing it across your clear coat to get it off. And the closer you go, the more pressure you apply, the more marring and scratching you're actually causing. Um, so there is a way to kind of mitigate the damage that's done when you do this. Um, for starters, be proactive earlier in the season if if it's fall or springtime that's when i like to do it do a complete decontamination of the car that means um, doing a bug and tar remover to the car doing um uh, sorry the iron decontamination uh, doing clay bar and uh, you know seal the clear coat with a ceramic uh, detail coating or a um, paint sealant um, uh, or you can use like a silica spray but some, something is like a barrier of protection between the clear coat and the outside elements benefit of doing this it actually works really really well um, when you go to those pressure wash places um, when you blast your car off it just comes right off it's really quite impressive, um, the difference between not having it and having it. You have to think of the paint as being porous, right? So when there's nothing protecting the pores of the clear coat from the dirt and stuff that's gonna be sticking, it embeds a lot deeper and it's harder to come off. So um, you're almost forced to have agitation, you know, with a mitt and like, and scrub it off. But if you put on these coatings, um, it's almost like a Teflon or, you know, Scotch guard <laughs> on the entire car. Uh, it's sitting on the car, it sticks, but it will blast off really easily. And that's uh, what I would recommend as being the, the best thing to do. Aside from that, you know, never use agitation, those brushes and the car washes, uh, that's just begging for, you know, a nice bunch of scratches in your paint. Um, and just to see if you can find like a foam cannon at the at the very least, because not all car washes have them, and I've come across this doing long road trips, what do you do? Um, they usually have uh, like harsher chemical degreasers or pre-washes um, that are designed to break down um, some of that thicker stuff. It comes out very softly, but it's, a, it's harsh chemical stuff that will break down that surface layer and then blast it off just with water. Um, that should do the trick, but just keep in mind the more often you do it, that that silica spray or the paint sealant ceramic coating you put on is gonna be sort of um, getting lower and lower the, the more chemicals and stuff you put on it. And I, I should mention one of the goals that I had originally when I did the paint sealant, silica spray, uh, all these kind of layers of, of coating that are, um, prevent stuff from sticking to the car. I really just wanted to not have to 
manually hand wash my car uh, as, for as long as I could because it's a lot of work, it takes time. Um, I just want to take a garden hose and you know, blast it off and have everything come off the car. Well, it's not quite like that. It's pretty close. Like you'll find even with cold water, uh, you know, rinsing the car off, a lot of that, you know, surface deposits, they, they will come off, not perfectly, but you know, um, I actually, uh, what I'd recommend, there's a video I did about waterless car wash. Um, and I, um, I showed how like I use wand washes and this kind of protective coating. And then as a final stage, if there's a little bit of residue left, I'll use these waterless washes, uh, which are actually very effective at kind of cleaning that last layer off. Um, again, just trying to minimize how much marring and scratching is done to the paint. Um, but anyways, check out that video if you're curious about waterless wash because when it's freezing and it's winter time, you can't just pull out a hose and start, you know, rinsing your car off in minus 20 or whatever. So it's a good alternative uh, if you want to try and keep your car clean during the winter months. The main thing I would recommend is watch, I think it's episode six um, of the car wash series. It's decontamination uh, on why buy and just learn how to do this properly so that you can protect your car. And it really, it, it sounds like a lot of work, but it, you only do it twice a year. It doesn't require a lot of uh, products and um, it's just a, a good way to extend the life of how your car looks um, so that you don't prematurely cause marring, swirls and scratches and you have to do, you know, uh, um, polishes and, and wear down your clear coat and, and all these things. So uh, yeah, check out that episode and learn how to do it. It's really not that tough and it's kind of therapeutic. <laughs> and now it's time for a little cold start. Let's see, three degrees. Oh, got to do my brake pads soon. <laughs> In the car wash series. I can't wait to decontaminate this thing. Look at this stuff. It's like sand. Liquid sand. It's in everywhere. Okay, so now let's talk about the realities of uh, parking your car outside in the winter, you know, whether you're on a road trip or at home or whatever. No one likes going out to a freezing cold car in the morning and uh, thankfully we have remote start, but if you have one of these cars, uh, this generation of Audis, they don't have a uh, remote start and you'd think, well, buy the module and install it. <laughs> it's not that easy. Um, you actually have to sacrifice a thousand dollar key fob to put into the car so that the system can recognize, um, you know, that, uh, it, it can be allowed to start remotely. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's something that I really miss about the Honda Fit because <laughs> that car was so cheap to run and it, you know, you put in a hundred dollar module and, and now you have remote start in your car. <laughs> Uh, the nice thing is, I will say uh, about Audis, is that um, they're engineered rather well for the cold and their batteries are so large that, you know, you could leave it parked outside without the car warming up or having been run for quite some time. Um, again, it's all gonna depend on the weather conditions where you're at, but it usually has a pretty easy time starting up in the winter, um, even if it's, if it's been left sitting a couple of days. Um, but yeah, the one thing I'll caution you against is, you know, if the battery's health is low, make sure you, you know, have it serviced or check the, the ionization level, I think, or the acidity level. I can't remember what they check, but to see the health of your battery, because it does uh, play a significant factor for winter driving. And the last thing you want is to be out on a road trip somewhere and your battery just dies. <laughs> you see some people on the side of the road, right? Um, Cause uh, their alternator just can't charge the battery. And it's like, and the, the car just dies. So make sure your battery health is uh, good too. 
Uh, the other thing, which sounds obvious, but a lot of people don't have is like an emergency kit in their car. Um, it could have things like, you know, painkillers. It could have things like a road flare or some matches, or uh, it might have, you know, just simple things like granola bars, food. Because if you ever get stranded and you're in a situation where, you know, it's an emergency, you're out in, in the middle of nowhere and it's, and it's cold and desolate, you might not have cell service. It's always a good idea to have an emergency kit and you know maybe some some winter boots and socks and uh, you know a toque and stuff like these are things that um, you can easily overlook and if you're not prepared uh, it could be you know the difference between life or death <laughs> So if you're wondering why my car is on a flat deck, um, keep an eye out for the second half of this video. I'm gonna be going over not just what happened, but why you should really have things like Audi aftercare and roadside assistance, and of course, the peppermint oil and uh, dryer sheets. Uh, so if you thought this portion of the video was helpful, please like and subscribe, show your support, and thanks for watching. Is that a train? Are we still rolling? Yeah. I can get him to... No, no, they're stopping. Oh. <laughs> this is good product placement for CP Rail. Yeah. You need Maybe they'll rail sponsor. Your rail needs. <laughs> yeah, if you're looking for good industrial transportation of your bulk industry goods, look no further than CP Rail. And thanks to them they're for the sponsoring. <laughs> now they're going back. Maybe. Two. Oh. That ruined 15 minutes of filming. Thanks, CP <laughs> So back to the tools. I think there's another train coming. There is another train coming. What is going on? <laughs> I somehow get the feeling. It'll go by, it'll go by. That's what it feels like. Hourglass. On, you wanna make sure that they're torqued to spec and that you don't cross thread or strip the lug nuts. And the train's backing up now. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. On this episode, we talk about trains. It's not a closed set. What do you expect? <sighs> it's just non-stop. Fuck, and it's a fire truck to boot. Hey. Okay, back to the shoot. Where were we?